Hi, good evening everyone. Thanks for coming this evening to this talk with Saad Qureshi, our artist who is currently exhibiting on the solo show we have uh, until the 27th of November. Um, on the panel today we've got James Putnam and Ishrat Kanga. James is an independent curator and um, used to work at the British Museum as uh, the setting up the contemporary department and curating exhibitions at the British Museum independently and for the, for the museum. And Aisha is a specialist from Sotheby's and has been working there since 2010 and is in, she specializes in the modern and contemporary South Asian art department. Um, I'm going to pass you over to Saad, but just to give you a small context of um, his relationship with the gallery and how we've arrived at this exhibition today. He has been working with Mila Askarova since 2010. Um, we first started by doing a series of pop-up exhibitions before opening the space here in Dover Street. Um, Saad had one uh, sculpture piece in uh, an exhibition just after he'd graduated from the Slade School and following that had a solo exhibition here in 2012. Yeah. 2012. Um, from that, we've been working towards this, this new body of work, which leads us to the exhibition here today. Sad, I will pass it over to you to discuss this body of work and how it's, you've arrived at this, at this exhibition. Okay. Where do I start? Uh, okay, I think that you mentioned my very first show with the with with the gallery uh, in 2010 Ten. 11 um, and I made a piece called quicken it was a, a you know a, a monumental uh, sculpture which was um, uh, you know it was like a fallen mosque tower um, but something really interesting happened in that show was that, that like I, I used it was a real kind of turning point for me in my in my the way I was working. Um, a, I'd never worked on that scale before, never used those materials before, and also never worked with a real kind of uh, issue or story before. So it was that was the first time that I kind of really combined all of these things together, and it kind of worked for me. And I thought it was. Um, and quite a breakthrough in my work. Uh, but what was also really interesting was that following that, mm -hmm. um, I became really interested in uh, a, the materiality, uh, be how I can use um, how I can use certain materials to, or how I can manipulate certain materials to articulate a certain story, and how they can kind of walk um, side um, hand in hand, uh, sideways. And um, what else did I say? <laughs> <laughs> From that, how from, is from, from that, from that, how uh, is from that? that, I think that, and then the following show was, uh, you know, it was really about. Uh, oh, sorry, I, 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 what I wanted to say was about using this mosque tower, mm -hmm. a, a religious symbol, uh, but then sort of talking about ideas that were not so religious. So. Um, and, and that kind of really interested me a lot, and I think that that was something that I, I thought I really wanted to work with, you know, religion and how could I kind of work with religious stories or religious sort of icons, but kind of uh, talk about other more sort of worldly um, stories or issues that I, I kind of, I'm still kind of working with at the moment. Um, fast forwarding my last show here was all about sort of uh, landscape and memory and how it sort of they're both affected by time uh, but the storytelling was still kind of a big part of that show where I was kind of collecting memories from other people and then materializing them um, but then again the materials that I was choosing I thought they kind of really helped um, uh, kind of that was kind of a natural uh, progression in, in kind of t telling of those sto stories. Um, so that I, I did that in 2000 and what tw it was 12, 12. right? Uh, and then I, I did get a bit stuck after after that, after that point. I didn't really know where, where my work was going and, and where I, where I could take it. Uh, and then that's what the, this big kind of trip happened. Uh, you know, towards the end of last year and and uh, into this new year, um, I uh, went to Mecca. Uh, you know, with my with my parents, we, we we decided to take this big kind of trip, uh, one of those religious duties, and it was just kind of I was just at the right place, at the right time, and it was, everything just fallen fallen into place. Um, the amazing, stunning landscapes. Um, 
the, the, the culture, the power of the culture that really sounded these amazing landscapes, I was really struck by. Um, but what I was immediately questioning was the, the kind of what it was that was making these landscapes and these places and these objects um, so important and so significant that they were, they were actually taking on importance beyond their physical presence. So like for, for the uninitiated, I guess it would be nothing but a stretch of landscape or a bird or, or, or mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Uh, but I think, but then when you have that information planted in your head, then it kind of really becomes larger than life and it really takes on this huge presence. Um, and I think a couple of examples I kind of talked about in this show was that when we uh, first arrived at the uh, in Mecca, the Grand Mosque, um, I became uh, I, I I kind of noticed these birds, these small birds that were uh, flying in the mosque, you know, tweeting, very sweet little birds. Um, I just you know acknowledged them, but didn't really think much of them. Uh, and then later on, we we did get a, a guided tour uh, of all the historical uh, places in in Mecca, um, where they were kind of telling us you know the, the 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 significance of each one of those. And we we kind of ended up back in the in the Grand Mosque, and the guide person pointed at the birds and talked about like how you know we they were. Um, described as the soldiers of Allah, God. Uh, and, and that immediately kind of really, I was like, whoa, like, it was a, it was a big, it was, I thought that it was like a big eureka kind of moment. And like, that kind of really, um, I think, validated what I was kind of really thinking about how uh, this, this relationship between matter, material, mm -hmm. aura, or the cultural, and how these two things were kind of connected. And I think then, then the birds kind of really became quite a big part of uh, the whole thing thinking process, like how I initially just saw them as just a beautiful little animal, bird, you know, bird, and then they kind of just really transformed uh, and turned into this big, um, uh, you know, soldier, soldier of uh, God. Uh, and that, that's, that was the kind of this big starting point for me mm -hmm. uh, in, in this, in t towards this body work here. And how did, how did you arrive at the sculpture downstairs, which is what he's referring to. Yes, sorry. Uh, the, the, the sculpture downstairs, okay. I mean, I, I, what I'll do is I'll briefly talk about the, uh, the, 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 the story that I'm working with, mm -hmm. and, then, and then we'll talk about how I kind of developed the idea on, onwards. So uh, the story mentioned very briefly in passing uh, in, in the Holy Quran is about these small Ababil birds um, who protected the sacred Kaaba, the black cube, uh, you know, from the from the army uh, who were kind of coming to attack it, to knock it down, uh, and then um, God ordered these birds to uh, protect the, uh, the the sacred Kaaba and to attack the army, mm -hmm. and the birds threw these small burning pebbles at the army and the defeated, um, the, you know. The, the the, the, the large army. Um, and I think it was kind of interesting that, you know, the, the more you kind of look at the story, there was no f kind of physical description of what these birds really looked like, um, you know, in, 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 the, in the holy text. It just kind of paints them under one big brush, like birds, uh, but there were no physical description. Uh, but then in the later writings on this on this story, um, they were kind of described variously, fantastical, um, you know, like the, 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 the mythologized, you know, they were totally mythologized by what the largest and the most beautiful birds ever seen and, you know, predatory faces, uh, pred uh, faces like a predatory animal, dog-like paws and green in color, you know, like, mm -hmm. so, and, you know, that was really interesting that, you know, we've got these two so contradictory uh, descriptions on, on, on this one, one thing. And I thought that, uh, again, it kind of tied in with what I was kind of really working with about the idea of, um, you know, the how things take on an importance and what, what kind of gives them that sort of uh, significance. Um, and I think because there was no uh, description, physical description in the text itself, that kind of really gave the opportunity for the believer's imagination to kind of just really go wild. wild. And we had to kind of really make these not into just any kind of small bird, but, you know, let's just completely go crazy and all out and uh, they, kind of, they were mythologized. So for, for the work downstairs, you know, which is titled Congregation, um, 
I, I kind of decided to marry these two descriptions together and bring, like, um, so I kept the size of the birds that I uh, had encountered in, in Mecca, but they, I based them on the, on the mythological description uh, that, was, that, you know, that, that came later uh, on the story. So that's how I can really combine these two sto- uh, the two descriptions together. Uh, so, so at the moment you've got these kind of 313 uh, birds, and they're they're perching on uh, 99 sort of plinths downstairs, uh, and they're ranged in this sort of army-like uh, format, you know, mm-hmm. which is uh, uh, you know like again, you know, this whole idea of you know um, the army of God and th- you know creating an army of these kind of birds. Um, yeah, I think. <laughs> And James, what are your thoughts on the installation piece downstairs? Well, uh, it's always an interesting thing wi- when you're looking at art, wha- how much you need to have uh, the story, you know, the context behind it. And I always like to take things on, you know, visually as I see them before someone comes and gives me often a lot of bullshit, you know, to do <laughs> with it. Uh, not in size case, cause which was very interesting, but I mean, you know, when people come up with a whole conceptual argument justifying something, you have to say, well, does it work, you know, visually as it work? And it did, you know, I, before he, he kindly come and explained it to me, um, I, I, I liked it, mm-hmm. you know, not even sort of even distinguishing that they were birds because you can't necessarily tell, but even they were kind of amorphous shapes, you know, I thought it was quite very striking. And the same went on for, for, for the rest of the show, you know, like the, these desert scenes and things, you know, I, you know, I just like them aesthetically. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, th- that was my impression of them. Yes, I think these are very, you know, beautifully done and, 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 and I, I did say, I mean, obviously it's a kind of dirty word, isn't it? Spiritual, but I mean, in, in terms of contemporary art, but I like work that does resonate something to me, you know, in, in, in a, um, how could you say, a kind of um, abstract way. You mm-hmm. know, it makes you, you think of all kinds of things. So even without knowing the story, I was thinking all kinds of things, which is, I think, really good for art. It makes you, stimulates you to your imagination, you know, so... Um, yeah, so that was my feeling about it. And then I liked the idea. And then, of course, I asked, you know, if he was religious, you know, because he immediately he sort of said he'd been on this pilgrimage to Mecca and all that sort of thing. And I didn't know if he was some kind of, you know, fundamentalist or whatever, you know. <laughs> but, but, but then I thought, well, it, you know, it, and then he said that it didn't, it didn't necessarily matter, but it was interesting that, um, you know, going on this journey had sort of stimulated him to make the art, and and, and then I thought, well, even if it does, even if it relates to something in the Quran, you know, they, it could be an archetypical thing that relates to other myths and legends in other cultures, mm-hmm. which is, I think, an important, interesting thing. You know, so um, yeah, so it, it resonated with me on many different levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as I say, on this aesthetic, when when he told me the the, the story behind it all, of course, it did it did sort of enrich what I'd already seen. So it was, it was very, it, it added something to, to, to you know, my, my um, impression of the work. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it all is, as I say, it, ha- it had a, a nice sort of sublime effect on me looking at all the works in the show. Yeah, I agree with James actually, because when I came to view the show earlier this morning, um, you know, at first I had just come into it from a perspective of just looking at these works without really knowing anything about the story behind them or what might have been some of the factors that influenced them. And it was really interesting because, you know, yes, you know, the birds had had a different significance for me. And, um, you know, knowing that there were 99 plinths immediately made me think of the 99 names of Allah. You know, my family is Muslim, so you know, I, I drew some a different kind of connotation that might not have been what, what Saad was thinking when he thought of making 99 plinths. And similar with these, with these paintings on, and drawings on wood, um, when I first saw them, they reminded me of these topographical sepia photographs that, that I come across a lot, um, you know, working at Sotheby's because we sell them in our travel department. And, um, and so, you know, I was like, oh, these are these beautiful, like, landscape. And then when I actually saw them in person, you know, realized that they've, they've got these really, like, cheeky contemporary elements and architectural um, sort of structures that are, like, hidden away. And, you know, and I took that 
from looking at them well before, mm -hmm. you know, Saad, you know, you should actually talk about these. <laughs> yeah. Because you mentioned landscapes in the beginning when you went to Mecca and how the landscape there, you know, you found them really beautiful. And I was quite curious to know if, if you've drawn from some of those landscapes. Yes, I mean, all of the, the drawings in this, in this show, uh, the, or the, the landscapes, uh, they, uh, like, neither of them are actual, it's like one place. Uh, I've, I've um, depicted and compressed, like, various different landscapes into one drawing. So, it, it's... Um it, that's intentional, isn't it, to create that kind of ambiguity so you can draw on different references with these pieces so there isn't a specific location or, or reference to Absolutely. these works. Absolutely. I mean, it's I supposed to be sort of dreamlike quality almost, where some of it's true to form, some of it's random, such as the poles, such as these deep shadows that you see in the, paint, the picture up here. These are things that you've just added as, as you've worked Absolutely. I mean, you know, you know, I've just made them up as I as I go, uh, as I start working on on the drawings. But I mean, I do hesitate in talking about each one individual mm. uh, drawings um, and and then <clears throat> describing which bit I took from where and and how you know I've kind of you know the, the, how I've arrived at this uh, at this image. Uh, but I mean, I, I don't really even see them as like landscapes, like kind of separately to the the sculptural pieces in the show. And I think that they're, they're so kind of integral part of like they're so interconnected with one another. Like I, I think like one would be totally lost without the other. Like mm. <coughs> excuse me. Um, I think like my all of my objects, the the sculptural pieces, really need this context to um, a either hung, hang on to or kind of you know, drop out of. Uh, and I think without these, all of the, the sculptural pieces in the show would be, would be rather lost or just floating in midair. Um, but I think as, as, a, as just something what you were talking about, the, the, the pure aesthetic of the, uh, of the show or of any of the work, and I think that's really important mm -hmm. because, I, you know, I've always gone with that. You know, like, you know, you conceive an idea of what you want to talk about in the work. Uh, and then the materiality is kind of secondary, but it's also very, very integral, you know, like that's because that's what's going to help you kind of convey or articulate this idea. And then once you've, once you've selected the materials, then you let go. Mm -hmm. Then you have to then let go of this really strong um, conceptual idea that, you know, you've started off with. And you, that, that's, that's the time that you play with your materials. And the, the aesthetics, the... Beauty again is another kind of dirty word in the contemporary world. I think it's it's so important for me. That's what I really hold on to, mm -hmm. you know, the the ideas of beauty and and the hand madeness, you know, the hand <coughs> made the hand touch, the human touch. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really important. And I think that again helps articulate some of those stories, the ideas that I can really talk about. So. And touching on materiality, how did you arrive at this um, type of wood, which is um, called gaboon wood? I mean, I, I, did, <coughs> I did a lot of um, looking around. I looked at a lot of different types of um, plywood. And, you know, I, I did do a, a couple of drawings on birch plywood, mm -hmm. uh, which is a lot lighter and, and finer in the grain, uh, li lighter in colour. But it did, didn't really work for me. I think that... The, the, the grain was somehow not being integrated into the landscape um, so successfully as I think some of these are. Mm -hmm. um, so then I, I kind of looked at the... Um, I, I discovered this gaboon plywood, which is A, uh, the richest in the grain. It's got the, 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 you know, the, the biggest kind of grain, uh, and also it's, it's the darkest in colour uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, plywood. Uh, range that you know you can you can get so and I, as soon as I just saw it I, I just it just kind of clicked and I knew this was the right one the, when when I was you know um, unwrapping the, the the blank panels while they were arriving in my studio uh, I just knew exactly which landscape to put on which one really? as like the the grain and the color were really dictating that for me they were kind of really telling me that that's what they kind of really want to be turned into so it kind of just really lends itself to, to that. So that's why I kind of talk about like where you pick a material 
and you just have to believe that whatever you do with it, however you manipulate it, mm -hmm. it will kind of somehow add up to that. Mm -hmm. And you just have to kind of really go with that belief and just kind of make work blindly in a way. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. is, it just a th is it just a thin veneer or does it go the thickness of that frame? Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's about eight, six, six or eight mil uh, and then it has a subframe. Uh, that sports. The and what's he, is, it's not usually used in construction, is it? Because it, obviously, when you buy a piece of plywood from the wood store or something, it's usually got horrible. They don't in stock it. this wood. This is a very specialised. Specialised. It's stuff, uh, yeah. it's one of the artist surfaces that they oh, work really? on. Okay. It, I mean, I, I wouldn't really just make a, a fourth wall with this wood. It's very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I wouldn't just want to buy it and just paint it white. And yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about it is when I first encountered it, I, I didn't realize it was wood. You know, when mm. I saw the reproductions of the work and then I looked closely, wow, it's wood, you know. Mm. But, uh, do you know anyone else that's using that, that technique? Is, is it something you just discovered or other artists using it? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I am aware of uh, a number of contemporary painters yeah. uh, who, again, work with, uh, you know, wooden panels. And, and some way in the painting, um, they, they have revealed uh, the wood in the, yeah. in the painting. So it's kind of really become part of that. But I mean, I, I, but I haven't really seen what I've, I've done in terms of like the, the wood or the, you know, really becoming part of the image. As, as it but was. you chose it specifically because you were doing deserts, desert related scenes. Obviously, it's not going to work so well, perhaps, with other landscapes, is it? Because it is that desert color, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Way. I mean, yes. Yeah. But I, I, I guess, you know, when, when I need to do, I don't know, a big architectural uh, drawing, yeah. I'll think of another material that would be appropriate to kind of talk about that, that yeah. kind of body work. But for this one, yes, I did, I did pick this one because it was the, the right one for the landscapes that I wanted to work with. But you have worked on with wood before. I, I have, but I've been really uh, working on top of it and not really integrating making it part of the image, the no, at, at all. So yes, I've been working with, I mean, some of those really small, uh, miniature, uh, <laughs> miniature inverted commas, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, paintings that they were all on, on, on wooden panels, but I had painted all over the surface and, you know, there was very little. To do uh, with the actual yeah. materiality yeah. of. Yeah, I think that this is, again, uh, for, for this show, I think this is the big sort of uh, breakthrough for me. It's that, in, in this show, I really set myself out to not use any applied color at all in this show. There's no applied color. You know, it's all the, the materials are bringing their own color. So they're kind of dictating the, the color and the texture of the, of the works, which kind of, again, you know, contributes the whole mood of the show. So, I mean, again, if you saw my last show here, The Other Crescent of the Moons, which was all about applied texture and applied color or the lack of it uh, and and this one is all about kind of really stripping it down to the basics and just working with the with the materials and how they would kind of help uh, contribute to the concepts that I kind of wanted to talk about in the, in, in, in the work. I actually did notice that earlier I don't know James if you noticed that when I had a look at the show one of my comments at the end was there is a very noted absence of color mm. Um, and it's really, really lovely to hear that you actually decided to let the true, you know, materials like was it graphite and chalk the, the, and the wood and plaster yes. and hay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but there, but obviously the the, the 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 ground as such, the plywood is a lovely warm colour, isn't it? Mm. So that you 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 don't see them in a monochrome way. Mm. You see them as 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 col col they're colourful, uh, uh, as the subject matter dictates. You know, as, uh, as a desert, you know, they're they're, they're not uh, monochrome. Um, you know, they've, they're, they're, you know, obviously the white wouldn't show up so well, you know, in, in, in that context. So, I think that's one of the appealing things about them is, that, is they give a, they warmth to them, don't they? they they're, they're hot, aren't they? You've, obviously, because of the desert, you think of the heat, but I mean, they do have that arid, hot warmth no I, th I, I think so I th and I think that works really but then again with, with, with I mean it's, it's kind of really interesting what a shadow can do you know it can really tell a whole different story uh, in this piece for example you know like the, the shadows I think that they really make it so much more intense and I was really debating whether I wanted to have this you know I wanted to draw these shadows 
uh, and I did them initially and it just really intensified the whole experience of looking at it you know because then you're aware of the heat mm. in this place like you know it must be really hot there that's casting this really dark shadow um, yeah. Did you cu- did you c- come back with, with with photographs of your trip that you you based some of these around, or, or was it totally in your in your mind? Uh, totally. A combination of the yeah. two. Um, I do. I have in 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 the, in the drawings. I definitely have worked with the uh, with some images, but again because because I wasn't really working with one image for one drawing there were like a multiple images that I was only just depicting certain elements from one landscape and just putting it in into this one to make the the drawing work for me um, so it was kind of a bit of a bit of both really you know was, mm. there, are, there are elements that are just totally made up uh, they were not there in the landscapes and there was some that I so the core of the, the structure of the landscape is from photographs but mm. then all the detailing is kind of more made up so it's yeah. And does, it, does the desert itself um, represent, symbolise something to you? Because 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 the desert always looks kind of very, you know, kind of romantic in a photograph. But in 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 a sense, the desert is actually very dangerous place. It's a place of symbolising death in a lot of ancient cultures, um, because it's so dry and and, and arid and. Um, you know, lack of water and things like that. You know, I mean, did it, was there any symbolism behind it, or what? I I didn't think of that. Yeah. You know, that's the honest answer. But I mean, I, but, but I am really interested in what you're saying, and I think that this is something that you know I've always really wanted to come so you know because every time I'm, I'm actually asked to talk about my work I really hesitate because like how much do I talk about and wh- and how much do I give away yeah. but because for me I think I am equally interested in what what you can bring to the work so no I hadn't really thought about the the symbolism behind landscapes when um, a desert uh, while I was making these works but but I was aware of the the elements there but I didn't really give it a very kind of long big long thought but I'm really interested in that. Yeah, I mean, like when you, I, I remember being um, going to a desert in Egypt, uh, an oasis in, in Siwa, and we drove out in sort of jeeps in the night, and um, we totally lost our way. And then from the other jeeps, and then we just thought we could die out here. You know, it's dark. You don't know where you're going. You know, it's a very dangerous place, you know, but that kind of desolation Mm -hmm. is also somewhat appealing or the idea of infinity that you're kind of heading out into a, a, you know, a void of of, of where everything looks the same, which is uh, interesting. I mean, um, I think that's referenced in this piece in particular with uh, a number of the contrast between where there's green and life in contrast to the foreground where there's no life and it's barren and there's nothing that's able to grow in that particular location, which was a, a, a source of inspiration for you, no? Absolutely. Yes, I mean... I think it goes back to what James was saying earlier as well about how it's what you take from it, you mm. know? So you obviously had this experience in the desert mm. and, you know, I'm assuming, I might be wrong, but, you know, when you thought you were lost, of course, one of the first things you think about is water, you know? Am I going mm. to be able to find a source of water? And so obviously, you know, then looking at these, it kind of brought back your particular... Yeah, I mean, like for me, because I I'd, I'd, I'd spent a lot of time uh, studying Egyptology and ancient Egypt, and then I mm. thought, first of all, when I came here, I thought Seb was, a, was an Egyptian artist because of these you know, images of the desert and that sort of thing. And so... Um, you know, you come with sort of preconceived ideas, you know, and um, in the culture that I studied um, it, with Egypt, there's the, there's the sort of East Bank and the West Bank. The East Bank is more fertile and the West Bank is, 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 is the place of death. It's where all the cemeteries are, the Valley of the Kings and all that sort of thing. And um, it's basically all, you know, desert and, and then the fertile area is, is just the, the area that's, that's thrown up by the Nile when it floods. So um, it's, yeah, deserts are very, I found very evocative to me to, you know, think of, I suppose if you, you think of ancient cultures and things mm. like that, you know, mythology and all that sort of stuff, you know, um, yeah. And Aisha, I wanted to discuss um, and a little bit more about the market and where you see from a specialist perspective uh, Saad's 
positioning within within the contemporary market? Um, well, um, that's a tricky one actually because just speaking with with Saad earlier, um, you know, I, I do understand that artists are, are really some of them are quite keen not to be classified so intensely because sometimes it's really not about uh, a label. It's really about what they're making. And, and you know, it, it's just a, a, a truth of, say, the auction world where, <clears throat> you know, the sale that I work on is called Modern and Contemporary South Asian Art. It really doesn't mean that that you know like we're just taking specific types of art and then just grouping them together really it's it's a very broad mm -hmm. uh broad aspect and it's just artists with any kind of relation to south asia they might not have even been born in south asia they might be of distant south asian origin um so i i would hesitate to actually classify <laughs> sad's work like that in the market but um but it's really interesting because you know, I work in the secondary market, whereas Saad is primarily in the primary market. Um, but it's really interesting because it's, it's the artists that give a lot of thought to their practice and really try and, and come into their own and do their own very unique things that make it into the secondary market that are successful artists. And so it's really exciting to see these new ideas and I've never seen a work on uh, this type of wood before, you know, there might mm -hmm. be other artists working in it, but I think it's very, very exciting and dynamic practice and body of work. And how do you see the uh, contemporary Pakistani um, art t artists rising or it is, developing? Yeah, it mm -hmm. absolutely is. Um, actually, Indian contemporary art had quite a boom in 2006 to 2008, right before the crash. Um, where there, you know, contemporary works were selling for astronomical, astronomical prices, and then the market crashed. And actually, what's happened is since the crash, people are looking to more accessible, more reasonably priced works. And so, what they started doing is they started looking more at Pakistan and collecting more Pakistani contemporary. And you saw this sort of resurgence. Not that there hasn't always been uh, great, you know, Pakistani contemporary art out there, but you've seen this resurgence uh, because of the price levels and because, you know, the, 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 that's what the market was responding to at the moment. And so now you'll see in auction catalogs, there's actually dedicated spaces for just. Pakistani art because they're they're trying to give it an, a more elevated platform and trying to really focus on it and not let it just get lost in the fray of this general term of South Asian art. So it's definitely, I would say, um, a rising, burgeoning market um, and something that that. But I hope will eventually just you know it shouldn't be just classified in its own. It should just be part of the greater canon. But it's through the nature of the auction house, the, the, the way that you're, you know, that it's divided into. Yeah. Like, say, for instance, Sir's work, you know, in, in a few years' time, can, would you put his work in in, 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 in a catalogue? Even though he's, he's, he's English, he lives in England. Yeah, you, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the way things enter into auction is when um, someone buy something from, from the gallery, which is the primary market, and then they sell it at auction, and that's a secondary market. Um, and yeah, absolutely, we would. But you wouldn't put him in if his name was John Smith. <laughs> Doesn't have the right. Well, if his, name was, <laughs> if his name was John Smith and he didn't have any connection to yeah. the region, then he'd be in a contemporary art sale mm -hmm. as opposed to a contemporary South Asian art sale. So okay. well. it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. just the nature of, of well, it. It is the nature of it. And obviously, I, I can remember it because um, I used to work before at the British Museum. And um, there was an element of the British Museum's collections um, where they did collect contemporary work. And of course, you know, they'd, they'd collect, um, you, know, art, uh, you know, Japanese artists or something like that who wanted to be contemporary artists, but they were boxed into the Japanese and you know, Asian department. And uh, the same went for Middle Eastern artists, etc. Not through the thought of the, um, you know, the museum, which has obviously in the past has been leveled at you know, being colonialist or, or, or um, uh, you know, having having that ethnographic thing 
you know, oh yes, we, 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 we'll put this work in, but, but, but through the nature of how do we acquire it? You know, as, as curators of various collections, we, we have an opening to, 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 to include it in our, you know, Middle Eastern collection or, or whatever, you know, and that, that, that's, that's how it happens, like yeah. you say, it's, it's the nature of, um, you know, institutions and, 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 and commercial enterprises that they do need to, to you know, to, to have a have a handle on something you know yeah but it's also the price points to some extent you know because if you look at a contemporary art auction which doesn't have that sort of label of, of region um the actual artists nationalities are completely varied you know um, you've, you're selling things from gerhard richter to um you know like lucio fontana mm. um but but you know they're selling at a certain price point and the people buying their works are also so multi-regional you know multicultural that then they get into that sort of generalized contemporary field and i think the reason why certain artists are sold in um, a more labeled catered auction like south asian art is because it's not only the the artists themselves but the buyers as well that are are you know more geared towards south asia Mm. So, so uh, t- some of your um, collectors who, or, or people that buy the work, are they from, from, from Southern Asia? They're mostly from South Asia. Right, so they're buying stuff that relates to their yeah. own So, uh, you know, right? yeah, so they might be NRIs, non-resident Indians, or NRPs, non-resident Pakistanis. They might even be born, say, for example, in America and have an American passport, but their parents were from India. or mm. So they have that sort of cultural connection. Um, and you'll see that in a vast majority of the clients that purchase in South Asian auctions. Mm. <laughs> Do you think that's from a religious connection or um, from these works? Do you think from a landscape reference? Do you think people can relate to it? I think it's both. And actually, I would like to ask Saad to elaborate mm. on that mm. because I was showing him one of the auction catalogs earlier. and. Um, do you want to tell everyone <laughs> what you felt about the works? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, the South Asian uh, auction that you just had, and uh, I was really interested in what you said about, you know, if you just remove the names and the description of all of these works, you know, these artists could be from anywhere around the world. And I just didn't really agree with that at all, I, I, because I, I can really recognize that aesthetic, the particular touch that I really associate with South Asia, you know, uh, Pakistan, India, uh, you know, artists from that region. And I, th- I think it's, it's kind of, I mean, I find it really sad, actually, that, you know, like, that it's, it's the market that kind of really dictates uh, how we get labeled and, and, and who, because this is something that really used to bother me a lot in my early student days. Like, I didn't want to be labeled as a, uh, you know, Pakistani British artist. And, like, no, I'm just an artist. So I kind of did everything that I could uh, to kind of really get away from it. But then you kind of really come in terms of the fact that that's something that's sort of outside of you. You know, you, can, mm. you can't control it at all. Mm. You know, I can only make work about who I am how I see and make sense of the world around me mm. and of my personal experiences. Yeah. And if, if they are mostly about, you know, my, uh, the, the people that I engage with on a you know, on daily basis, yeah. then that's what I'll make the work about. Yeah. And I think it's only that people uh, as, as viewers that would kind of really put that label on me. So it's really something that's out of my control. Yeah. I can't really control how I get labeled. Yeah. But it's sometimes you can use it to your advantage. That, I was just thinking yeah. that. <laughs> Best way, isn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, be, you know, because, you know, you're doing a show or whatever, and I do it myself, you know. I've got uh, artists from India, so I could get Cobra Beer or something to sponsor it or something like that. Or, or, or you know, ask the embassy to pay for a flight over, all that kind of stuff. And um, you know, I, I think I, I think you can. Uh, you can't stop it. People are gonna, you know, uh, tag onto that, and it's depressing. But it, it, it's you know, <coughs> it's not. You know, you, I, th- I think it's, you know, it's best to kind of you know, to, to use it if you can. You know, or if you know, yeah, some some wealthy collector or something wants to a patron wanted to spot him, but he happens to be from Pakistan, you wouldn't turn him down. Probably not, would you? If he said, "I'm going to fund a, uh, you know, a show at the Tate Gallery or something like that," 
No, I, I think that <laughs> that's really irrelevant, to be honest, because I think what's again, you know, we. You know, we as we were talking about earlier about this sort of you know um, artists making work in in that region of Pakistan, India, and I've, I've visited the NCA, you know, the leading art college uh, in Lahore, and you know, like they're all kind of um, you know, th th there was I, I really sensed this sort of such pressure of internationalism, you know, they, they, you know, they, they didn't want to make the works. That they wanted to make, but it was more about the works that, that would really kind of really get them out there, you know, onto the market and yeah. onto the the, the, the the map. And yeah. that's something that I found really sad. You know, mm -hmm. I think that that was really. Um, but then also, you know, the the fact that we look at the, the Western art scene, you know, American, you know, UK, European art art market scene as the you know the leaders, you know, the we're the lead. so there's this real hierarchy, you know, where the white sort of British, um, American uh, kind of uh, leaders are really kind of <coughs> controlling it all at the top. And then we're all just kind of, re then filter through, and then we're all just kind of blindly following it up, to, uh, you know, onwards. Uh, th that might be a huge generalization, kind of, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> kind of but, but I, that's, what I th I, that's how I see it. Yeah, but you're lucky in that you don't have that to prove, you know, and you're not coming as an alum of a prestigious um, art college that specializes in, you know, for example, miniature techniques from Lahore or Pakistan. You're, you're coming from, you know, having studied at Slade and, you know, and you're making art not to cater to, to what you think is you know, what people will respond to or what will gain you recognition. No, your, I, your I don't think art. there's anything wrong with that at all. You know, like whether somebody describes me as, you know, an artist, just an artist, contemporary artist, or a, a, a Pakistani artist, or <laughs> British Pakistani artist, yeah. I think that's just irrelevant. So, the, the, I mean, I think what I'm saying is that there's actually a bit of a con contradiction between the two uh, in, in what I'm saying. is. So the label is really irrelevant, but okay. on the other hand, I think it is relevant. You know, it, 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 <laughs> it's, it, <laughs> it's so you'd be happy to be um, to be in a South Asian art auction at Sotheby's. One of your works to be in there. <laughs> but I, I, I think I would question why isn't it in the in in, in the other um, uh, the, the, the the contemporary mm. um, uh, auction that, that you'd you'd host. So that would just be because of my name, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I. I think, like, okay, some of the early works, I think that they definitely did have a quite an explicit uh, reference to the miniature uh, uh, painting, uh, and some, so there was definitely there. But I think that over the since my last show with the gallery, I think it's definitely. Uh, I'm, I'm losing that. I, I, I think I'm, lo or maybe I'm just kind of this close to it and I can't see it myself. But you know, there's a lot of artists. I, I want to preface this whole thing <laughs> first by saying there's actually a lot of artists from the region of South Asia that we sell in both auctions. So it's not as if including it in one auction is actually excluding it from another. So there's a lot of artists that we sell in both our contemporary art auctions and modern and contemporary South Asian mm -hmm. art auctions. So it's not so much about really, you know, categorizing it and just forcing it down one path. It's, there's so many other factors like price points and the time of the year. Sometimes somebody wants to sell a work, the next auction coming up might be South Asian or it might be contemporary. <laughs> and so it'll just happen to go into the one more that's organic. more convenient for the seller or, you know what I mean? So Does this they have to do with how established they are? You know, yep. like say, say, say you had, a, you know, somebody really famous, international artist, you wouldn't have him just boxed into some, um, you know, uh, category like <laughs> yourself. I mean, I think it's uh, there's, uh, how established they are does mm. come into it a bit. Yeah. But then again, you have to be established to be selling in the secondary market, mm -hmm. you know, at an international auction house platform. Sure, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to touch on one more point before we open these discussions up to the table, the floor. But storytelling. And I know that this is running through all of your works for the last five years that you've been represented by the gallery. I just wanted to um, ask you a little bit more about how you see that moving forward in your work and where you see this body of work developing 
now that you've mastered these Chaco Gabin drawings. Yes, you have. Uh, these works started on a very small scale and they've been evolving over the course of a year that Sad and I have been taking them to lots of um, art fairs internationally and getting feedback from that and, and developing the process as we go along. So it would be nice. interesting to sort of take a stop and reflect it now and see where you think you're going to take it forward from there. No, uh, start in starting off with the, the idea of storytelling, which I think is very, very important to me. That's a really integral part of my, uh, of, of how I work. I get mm. really excited about stories, meeting new people, hearing or reading and knowing all of these stories, whether they're just like something really random or, or a very well-known story and how I can retell it and resurrect it within mm. the time. And, and, and the whole idea that, that the stories can't, can never really be owned you know they can't you know i can't i can never take the ownership of any particular story whether it's so personal to me or whether it's a you know it, it it's like whoever tells it you know will have a will bring something of their own to to the stories i think that's really interesting for me um and i i do i i think that that will always be the case and and how i kind of will make work um is that, that I love filmmaking. That's something that we, we kind of touched on briefly mm. before. I love the fact that you know you can sit in front of this huge projection and follow this moving image, and you're following this narrative that will or will not kind of conduct, at, you know, will conclude to something that you know you kind of take away with you at the end. And but but on, on the flip side, I think the, the the interesting thing about the idea of storytelling in in art is that you only have one image, you know, whether it's it's a 3D or a 2D image that you know you you have, and you have to really kind of work with that and get get the story out of it. Mm -hmm. and I think that's really interesting, like how um, you know it, it's more about peeling peeling it down and, mm -hmm. and digging the story out mm -hmm. from from that. So, and I think it's it's more abstract. So it's a more abstract um, way of telling a story. But then in terms of where I see all of this work moving forward, I honestly haven't got a clue. Um, because I, 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 every time I plan something, like this is what I'm gonna do next, it never, it never goes accordingly, ever. It either um, it just fails in the experiment, experimenting, developing kind of uh, time, or I just kind of move on to something else very quickly. Um, so I think at the moment I'm just kind of taking time out to reflect on what I've done and mm. hopefully something will fall into place somewhere. I'm like, oh, okay, of course, <laughs> this is what I need to do. So I think I just need to give it time before I can know. Okay. Do, do we want to open this up to the floor to any questions of what we've been discussing so far? Okay. I'm really interested in this storytelling uh, story. <laughs> uh, you mentioned earlier on about um, the sculptures being, uh, or, or the, sorry, the drawings being almost the context for the sculptures. Are they, to some extent, characters on stage? Um, yes and no. Um, I, I wouldn't like to uh, consider the drawings as like the backdrops for my sculptures, because I think that kind of really. Um, belittles them a little bit uh, but I see them as more of arenas uh, like these kind of places where these kind of events happen you know where, where things kind of really come out of so they, they kind of are um, I, th I think like you know the, um, backdrops or the, the, the kind of the um, what, sorry, what, what did you say the context the, the context the, the you think, the th yeah the, the, so the, the backdrop, as in like being, being the stage for the for the drones, are yes and no. So that's what I'm saying. It's it's kind of yes because I kind of see them as like providing a context, like a platform uh, for the this kind of sculptures to kind of uh, be in context. But no, the, they they kind of are more about uh, the idea of like the full story, as it were, not just the story that's something happening behind this backdrop. Does that help? That's a really interesting combination, I think, because there's this space between. Thank you. Oh dear. Oh dear. Yeah. Um. 
So how did the, how did the, um, the, 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 the actual um, installation of the show, I was interested to know how that came about. Did, did Emily sort of say that we want you know, six paintings and an installation, or, 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 or is the whole thing your vision of you come to the space? I'm not interested in it, obviously, mm. as a curator from an exhibition point of view. You come to the space and, 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 and you sort of size it all up and say, I'm going to have so many paintings here and this here. How, how did that... Was there a... Well, I mean, actually, neither of these two... Uh, <laughs> these two. I think it kind of just happened. Uh, it was just one of the things that, you know, like... Um, Again, firstly, referring back to my last show, which was kind of very much about individual works. You know, I had a big central piece downstairs, and then there were like other works there, and there were two works here, and then like it was it was so much about one individual work within that show as a whole, um, and that's something that I really did not want to repeat again th for for this show. So I really wanted to make the whole show as being like one piece or like one experience that you can really walk through. Um, but really, there were no set rules or kind of but requirements. Did it help the fact that you'd done a show here before, so you were familiar with the space and the layout of the space? Because obviously that is an important thing, isn't it, as an artist knowing your space? Actually, it, 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 it kind of didn't, because yeah. uh, the, 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 the plan, the initial plan for the, um, uh, for the installation. installation downstairs was completely different, different uh, to what we have yeah. downstairs now. So uh, The space sort of dictated a little bit. It, it, it did, but so, so the, the, kind of the, the two things were made separately and then bring them together and sort of just see how the space would best adopt the works around it. Mm -hmm. So Sad's studio, it's, it's smaller than the space downstairs. So at no one time could he put all of the plinths right. together um, to kind of visualize how it was going to look. So not only were the, the, the birds not actually assembled on the plinths, but the layout was completely uh, decided when it arrived here. So yes, there was lots of experimenting with, with running it all the way down to the bottom of the gallery space and then condensing it again into a kind of more uniform format to convey that kind of army regimented um, feel. Um, yes, it was very much the artist who was like, who said to us, <laughs> I've got these man works. How are you going to make it look fabulous? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but we worked together on 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 putting the pieces together. No, we did. But there was, there was again a lot of editing. We we took mm. like two drawings out of the show, and we just really wanted to work with the with the space and how <laughs> we can really kind of make the show work as mm. like a one walk through experience, rather than kind of making it a showcase of the works. Mm. Uh, so it was kind of it, I think it kind of just happened. Organically, yeah. the, the whole process just kind of just. How do you? How does it work with you when you curate your shows? Do you have a set sort of structure? Funny enough, I do. It's exactly as you say because people sometimes people are very methodical and they want to have a plan of the show and you know and I always say you know we we don't really know till we get there you know we've got to fiddle around with it you've mm. got to have some idea obviously to know what what dimensions you're dealing with but. Yeah. It's very much a matter of, sort of experimentation, you know, it can be lighting and things, considerations. I mean, here it's obviously quite brave of you to put, put it right in front so that, which is, you know, the walk through of the gallery, you know, so mm -hmm. basically even to get to those works at the back, you've got to walk through the, the your very fragile sort yeah. of installation, but it's effective because you can see it from, from the outside, from the street. Kind mm -hmm. of and I also thought so. it kind of added to, um, like having to walk through it actually adds to the experience. Oh, yeah. um, you know, because the space, I noticed this morning, because I had my jacket on, is just enough yeah. to, like, <laughs> walk straight through. But then, like, you know, my jacket swung a little bit, and I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to go and hit something. And, but it, it really adds to the experience. of, and, and, you know, I actually, funnily enough, didn't see it at first as those, like, regimented army, like, barracks. But then the minute you said it, it just clicked. And I was like, oh my god, yeah, that's how soldiers march in those perfect, perfect lines. So, yeah, it's great. I have a question. So, I mean, obviously, the artistic process is extremely personal, but it's also very difficult. But I think equally important is as an artist, juggling the commercial aspect, which we can't ignore. I know it's maybe a dirty word to talk about it when we're talking about the art, 
but sort of how do you, how much time do you devote to your personal artistic practice, and how do you balance that with sort of like strategic thinking? When am I going to go to auction? Who am I going to show at? Like, how do you do that? <laughs> it's really <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have. <laughs> that's why I have Emily. <laughs> So it's, I mean, I honestly, it, it did, uh, it was a major part of the thinking process um, earlier on. Um, you know, how, like, who do I see my targeted uh, collectors, buyers? Where do I sell this work? Where the, whether something will sell or not? I think it's, yes, of, of course, you know, it's inevitable that, you, you know, you have to kind of really think about that at some point. Um, but I think the the great part for me is that I'm with this amazing gallery which actually gives me the freedom to really experiment with like me as an artist uh, to just really experiment and, 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 and talk about the ideas that I really want to talk about and then we'll worry about the commercial side of it later and somehow it works you know like they, they, they make it work for me you know like so so I, I mean I think to help answer that, though, we did take a lot of these um, works to a number of art fairs internationally. Um, so starting on a smaller scale and a much sort of looser um, finish, uh, we began to kind of learn a lot more about w how the market was responding to these quite unique pieces and how we needed to adapt to make it more commercial and more receptive to, to, to the market without losing the essence of what the artist was, was trying to achieve. So a larger scale, technically using this type of wood to ensure that it could um, sustain in certain environments, um, framing the works to making, make it look more polished and finished, as sort of small uh, touches which have evolved over the course of the year whilst working together on them. No, but I, I think even when, when we were discussing the, the scale of the drawings, mm. you know, which, which initially they kind of only started off like yay big and then they kind of did, did only what, a meter and a half or so. Yeah. Um, and we, we were really thinking that, that that's what kind of really would, uh, would probably sell. But then it, but they, didn't, they were not right. They were not yeah. right to drawings they were not you know they just didn't just work conceptually there was something really missing because mm. they needed to, and and we just knew it immediately i just knew that they needed to be really big uh you know these kind of projections that you can re really walk through uh landscapes uh, but then you know we we had this kind of problem about whether they will sell you know being so big and and all of that so then there was this particular uh, way. uh all I, I, I don't know it kind of it just happens yeah I think it's just it's gauging that balance, isn't it? It's trying to get that balance um, without losing a sense of, of, of what it is that the artist is, is trying to convey. But uh, it's always a work in progress. Um, but but it is we work on together. Oh, sorry. No, but it is true that, to some extent, size will dictate, mm. you know, mm. the, the kind of um, the buyer and the market because... Right. You know, like the the beautiful congregation downstairs. Like I see it as more of a museum piece. Mm -hmm. I I don't know a lot of people with homes that, where they can <laughs> right, <laughs> line up these ninety nine plates. Um, <laughs> you know, so yeah, it, it, I guess it's true that some thought does go into it. Like, what is the most commercial size or? what might be. I think from Mila's objective as well is that Saad's an artist that we've been working with from right at the beginning and Mila and Saad have been working very closely in the development of the gallery and the development of Saad as an artist. So majority, you know, some of the pieces are they're an investment, an investment to profile Saad as an artist and um, the objective is not necessarily to sell but more to, to position him within the market for future works to sell in longer term. Are there any more questions? I think no. We're done. <laughs> Sorry, <tired. laughs> James, thank you very much. So thank, thank you, you very much for coming. And Saad, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>